famine or families kind of changes the interpretation of that passage there. It's not a whole different, whole different dynamic if we, uh, if we go on that translation. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the, the bishop had us all gathered for clergy conference at Camp Capers. He does that every year, every October. And we had a speaker that was the college, uh, a college teacher and chaplain at the University of Duke. He had been for a long time. Uh, he's kind of a well-known writer in the Christian world, uh, and he had stories and stories that he shared from his time as being a campus minister at Duke. And one of them he told uh, was for an Episcopal family, and it went uh, something like this. There was uh, a student that joined that was admitted to Duke, and as a freshman, uh, looked nothing like someone that would ever end up going into ministry. Um, I can relate to that. I can. I can. And uh, throughout his course in his life, he kind of had this conversion experience at his time in college through service projects and just being with other Christians and different things kind of impacted him. And he had grown in his faith throughout his time at Duke. And when he was a senior, uh, he wanted to tell his parents that he really felt God calling him to go into ministry. How his parents were wealthy and successful lawyers, and they were having every expectation that their son would be a wealthy and successful lawyer like they were. And um, uh, he asked if the chaplain would be there and meet with them together. They'd all go to dinner together and could talk about how he sees a call in his son and stuff like that. And so he said they went to dinner and the son uh, told his parents, I really think I'm being called to ministry and to serve the church. And he said the mother, her first words out of her mouth were, I can't believe that actually worked. And the son looked confused, and the dad looked confused, and he said, what are you talking about? She's like, I didn't think that would work. When you were a baby, you were sick and in the hospital. And, you know, I was terrified as a mother, so I prayed to God, and I said, God, if he pulls through, I will dedicate him. He can serve you in the church if you spare his life. It's like, but I didn't think God listened to those types of prayers for me or that that would ever happen to Episcopalians or that he thought I was serious. And here we are, 23 years later, the son saying he wants to go into ministry. And the, and the chaplain said, well, you know, God calls all kinds of people. He's like, but, but not people like him. You know, it was different, uh, different stories. Uh, and she probably thought, you know, there's other families maybe that have their stuff together more. Maybe they're a little holier. Maybe they're a little more righteous um, that God would do those types of things in. But here's the truth. God loves to pull from family dysfunction and families that are just messed up like all of ours are. Not to say anybody's families are bad, but I don't think anybody's family's perfect. And in our Old Testament story, we have a really kind of dysfunctional, imperfect family that we see God's grace working in. We have a story of Elkanah and his two wives, Hannah and Peniah. And, you know, the Bible never says, hey, polygamy is good, right? It just tells stories of this is what people did in those times. And, and usually the stories it tells are never good stories. It's never like, and everyone lived happily ever after. It's always stories like this where we have two spouses of one man and they're rivals. They don't even call themselves friends. They don't call themselves anything but rivals. And one of them can have children and one of them can't. And that's a very precarious position because if the husband were to die... Back in those days, if the husband were to die, the property would go to the sons. And if the sons were all of one wife, the other wife would be a widow with no son and would be out. And so it's kind of financially precarious. It's kind of just seen, you know, in society as, as uh, you know, something wasn't working right. It's just a whole slew of things. You know, we've, as you know, I'm not getting into that now. Sarah and I experienced seven years of that, you know, not being able to have a child. So we kind of have a little uh, a heart for this type of story. And so um, Hannah is just, this weighs on her. It, it, it distresses her. And she goes to, uh, they, they're in Jerusalem for the Passover. And she's sad. And Elkanah tries to be a good husband. I don't know if he was like the most compassionate guy in the world. He tries to cheer her up by saying, hey, aren't I better? Aren't I enough? Aren't I as good as 10 sons for anybody? 
and maybe he was trying to be comforting. Maybe he had a super high view of himself. I don't know what the story was, but it wasn't really, it wasn't really compassionate to, to what Hannah's heart was hurting over. And so uh, Hannah goes to, to the temple to pray. Now, the temple isn't built big like it was in Jesus' time at this time. It's just kind of a mobile, like, tabernacle operation. And there's an inner room where the men could go to pray, and there's an outer court where the women would go to pray. And so Eli, the priest, is sitting by the outer court, and he's watching the women. And um, Hannah comes, and she's super distraught. And the scripture tells us she offers this prayer, a Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child, then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall neither drink, uh, he shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, no razor shall touch his head. You know, a Nazarite was, was in, in those days a vow that people took to, to be closer to God for a time. Think about like giving up something for Lent. It was like a 40-day vow or a 60-day vow. It was very rarely ever a lifetime vow. But Hannah said, Lord, what she's saying is, Lord, if you give me this child, I will give him back. If, if, if you give me this child, I will give him back to you. It's like she's, she's, she's willing to let go of him back to the Lord's service if he's willing to bless her with a child. And she's praying very distraught. And Eli, the priest, looks at her. And Eli apparently should not be the person that's teaching how to grow your church uh, 101 or any of that because his first thought is, oh my gosh, here's a person praying their heart out. They must be drunk. Tell them to leave. Right? And so he goes up and he, so just so you know, Eli's not a good priest. He's pretty incompetent. And so there's some encouragement in this story that God hears your prayers even when your priest is incompetent, which I take great comfort in that message of the story. I want you to know that. I want you to take confidence in that, and I take great comfort that God hears your prayers even when your priest is fairly incompetent. Eli was pretty incompetent. That's, uh, that's a, a story for uh, another time in the book of Samuel, but Eli is not a good priest, and neither are his sons. And so Eli's not doing good at his job, you could say that, or maybe he just doesn't care. So he sees this woman that looks distraught, and he says, drunk, get out. And she says, no, you don't understand. My heart's broken here. I'm just praying to the Lord. And he's like, oh, okay. Um, may the Lord grant your prayers. <laughs> Again, not really great pastoral care by Eli, but here's the thing. It didn't matter. It was Hannah's prayer that God was hearing. And Eli, whether he knows it or not, is saying the thing that God's saying to her. Again, Great confidence that even a priest that doesn't know what they're doing can speak for the Lord on occasion says, the Lord's hearing your prayer. May it be answered. And so Eli um, tells that to Hannah, and she's encouraged. And she goes back, and the story says she has a son that's named Samuel. And so I want to I leave you with um, three things to be encouraged about from the story, because the story is meant to be an encouraging story. One is, God doesn't just work through families that have it all together. God most often works through families who don't, who, who have a level of dysfunction or, or have issues in them, right? I mean, all of our families have stuff. And God doesn't just say, give me the perfect family. That's whose prayers I'm going to hear. He hears Hannah because she's just pouring her heart out. It's sincere, right? And in the midst of her family dysfunction, he hears her prayer and answers it. So I want to encourage all of us that if you feel like, yeah, man, my family, there's some stuff going on right now that just is a mess. Like, God still hears our prayers. We don't need to have a perfect family or a perfect situation for God to hear us. Just sincerity. That's what Hannah said. Now, the second thing I've already mentioned, I want to encourage you that God hears your prayers regardless of the quality of organized religion around you. Right? Right? Eli wasn't a good priest. Neither were his sons. He was just the priest that happened to be there. And his response was bad. His reaction was bad. And he seems like he was just super harried and, and didn't know what to say. But guess what? He still spoke the Lord's word to Hannah. 
I, I want to, as I've mentioned, I find that encouraging for me. I hope you find it encouraging for you. The Lord speaks even through uh, priests that maybe are having an off day. The third thing that I think is really neat that we don't really see at the time is that God is always up to more than we think he is in our lives. And this is what I found. Most people think God does big things in other people's lives. God does big things in other people's lives. In our lives, he maybe does little things where other people have the big things happen. And, you know, God was working through Hannah and her situation to do something bigger than just give Hannah a son. Do you remember I told you Eli was a bad priest? And Eli's sons were bad priests. And so God was going to raise up a priest that was going to be faithful to him and lead his nation back to him. His name was Samuel. And he was going to be the child born of Hannah from that prayer. She had no idea that God would use that situation to bless the people. But he did. Because God is always up to more in our lives than we think he is. And he's not just doing big things in other people's families and other people's lives. He's actually wanting to do them in ours. So I would be encouraged if I were you today, whether your family situation is perfect or not, whether, you're, uh, and whether you think God does big things in your life or not, or whether you just think that's for other people, and be encouraged by this story to know that God is always up to more in your lives, in the lives of your children, in the lives of your family than you think he is. And to take hope in that, even when it seems like times might be a little dark, to take hope in God working. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.